you can check out this law of power I have today. Uh, Robert Greene's 14th law, pose as a friend, work as a spy. And I do apologize if I'm not making the best eye contact here. I'm sort of just doing this for review. Um, so yeah, let's really get into it. Law 14, pose as a friend, work as a spy. We're going to look at the judgment and it's really simple. Artful spying requires using indirect questions to reveal weaknesses and intentions. You have to know about your rival, and we have a great observance of this law. We'll go back into uh, the history of art collectors. You have two characters here, Mr. Joseph Devine, and then you have uh, Mr. Andrew Mellon. And let's get into the story here. You have Joseph Devine. He was a really great art collector from 1904 to 1940, one of the best. And his greatest desire was to have Andrew Mellon as a client. And when you're dealing with people so wealthy, it's not very easy to make them clients of yours and certainly not your number one client. But that's what Joseph Devine wanted. He, he wanted Mellon to be his best client and no one believed in him. No one thought this would be possible. They told him, you know, Andrew Mellon does not like your personality. He thinks you're too talkative, this and that. But he didn't get discouraged. He went to work. And many urged him, like I was saying, don't do this. But Devine chose to stay on track. He began studying Mellon, his habits, his tastes, his phobias even. He, he got to know him better than his own wife knew him. A Devine made entrenching discoveries, and he did this with artful spying. He actually hired some of Andrew Mellon's staff and put them on his own payroll as a sort of uh, social act of arbitrage. Devine booked at one point the same hotel in, I think it was London, with as Andrew Mellon, and they both had valets. So... Mellon was not aware of this. Devine was because he had his eyes, he had his ears out there knowing what Mellon was up to. So he had this hired valet let him know when Mellon was headed out to his car so he could run into him and make it appear by chance. And this valet tipped him off. That's exactly what happened. And uh, there, this was a, a choice encounter for Devine because he was able to surprise Mellon and it was a pleasant surprise. Uh, he enjoyed the encounter. He found Andrew Mellon found Joseph Devine as uh, charming. He was impressed with his knowledge and he was sitting there like, oh wow, this guy has a similar taste to me. And I'm sure that Devine showed off those tastes, you know, as coordinated with the research he's been doing on Mellon. So later on, after they had their encounter in London, hit it off, Mellon went and visited Joseph Devine's gallery. Now remember, Devine wants Mellon to be his client, not necessarily a friend. So he, he was posing as a friend, working as a spy. Uh, so Mellon made his way to Devine's art gallery, and Mellon loved everything about it, every piece of work, he was friends with uh, Joseph Devine now. So this led, actually led to Mellon becoming Joseph Devine's best and most generous client, which is awesome. It's, it's just, you know, he, he put in the work, he made it happen. And it sounds like even though he went through those lengths to learn so much about uh, the guy, Mellon, you know, hired Mellon's staff to do some spying. It sounds like they actually became friends. They hit it off. Uh, they have a common interest. And it was a whole altogether good situation. Now, let's look a little deeper into this uh, story, part of history. Devine, he was ambitious and competitive, leaving nothing to chance. His other advantage was putting his target client's household staff on his payroll. This allowed updated knowledge of prospects, happenings, tastes, and whatnot, the ins and outs. These actions discouraged Joseph Devine's competition. No one wanted to get near the wealthy guys anymore because they were scared of Joseph Devine. It seemed like he was everywhere but nowhere at the same time. Uh, 
and that really gave him a major competitive edge. Everyone thought, you know, this guy, he knows what's going to happen next. He has too much power. He's a real titan. We can't do anything about it. And going that extra mile for Devine, it made him. Um, I'm sure it's dangerous employing spies. Seems like it could be a make or break thing, but let's look into some of the actual uh, keys to power in Robert Greene's law. 14, pose as a friend, work as a spy. Keys to power are pretty simple. Employ spies. It's a powerful tactic, but it's also risky. The spies can turn on you, and we'll get into that in a moment. You're better off posing as a friend, but one thing you have to do is suppress yourself in conversation and just let others talk. It's that simple. You have to keep it simple. Gather information, and use your personality when you see fit. We'll go back, uh, legendary Tally Rand. He's a historical conversationalist, yet he did little talking. He didn't talk about his own ideas, but he would let other people talk about theirs. One thing you can do, send a false flag. This is another key to power here. Say something false and seemingly secretive just to see how people react. See how people start treating you differently, and you'll see who's talking about you. Uh, a false confession will often lead to a real confession. Another one here, this one's sort of dangerous. You might notice people using it towards you in your own life. Uh, playing devil's advocate, that can make people lose control and say things that you can later use against them. You got to notice when people are playing devil's advocate. Could just be natural to some people. Uh, another thing, um, unfortunately, a bodyguard of lies protects your truth. Um, yeah, quick, quick example of that whole thing. Uh, King Chosros would share secret information with courtiers to see who would start talking. So he would pick out one courtier, tell him a secret. And if the other courtiers started treating him differently, he would know that that one was talking. Um, if they didn't start treating him differently, then he would know that the one he told the secret to was someone that can be trusted. And that's really how you snuff out traitors. Look at uh, just the other side when using spies will not work, does not work. You can't predict it, but this is where, where the risky part comes in. We'll look at um, back in World War II. So Germany, they employed spies, of course, and they were actually employed, the German spies were employed in England, and they were caught. They were replaced with English spies that would feed the German Air Force bombers false coordinates. And this worked amazingly for England because... All of the German airstrikes failed. These German uh, warmongers, they were like, you know, we got the coordinates. They sent all their um, airstrikers to just pretty much rural areas where no one could get hurt. And that's when Germany thought they were employing spies, but uh, England was able to use their spies against them, use their tactic against them by replacing their spies and feeding them false information. And that's when the use of spies can be dangerous. So if you're hiring a spy, make sure that they're not firing you. <laughs> um, yeah, that, it's pretty simple. That's law 14 of Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power. Pose as a friend, work as a spy.